Welcome, Welcome to back. Our dish. Welcome to the petri dish. <laughs> Listen, we're we're all we're all gonna be good. Taking care of ourselves and washing our hands. Uh, and I've got six feet face. around each of us. Walking in your sleep. We're fine. All right. And this afternoon, just FYI, at 4 o'clock, uh, we'll be meeting in room 11. We may have to move up to the middle of the house, but we'll be in room 11 to talk about uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, and hear from the Department of Health and the Agency of Human Services. We'll talk about that a little bit later if you would like to. So today, we have S290 on the agenda. Jen will be down in a few minutes, but I want to point out to everyone that um, there is the bill draft 1.1 that we looked at previously, and then there's a new draft 3.2, and that is based on some of the testimony that we've heard, the input, especially from the Green Mountain Care Board, and then uh, the thoughts that we had about uh, putting some of this into a study uh, and working with, uh, with folks. So the section of the bill, I just want to point, out, point that out to you. We will have time. Jen is here. How are you? I just want to ask if there's any gap in this bill. There is. Um, I think that the main goal today on S290 is um, to listen about the, the new draft a little bit. We won't go through it. We'll go through it from a thousand foot level. And um, but we do want to get to uh, the part DFR and the Vermont State employees and human resources so we can listen to A, concerns, and then B, any uh, ideas around the study that's in the bill at the end. So Jen. All right, Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council. I do have a bunch of bills on the House floor today, um, so I you'll be in, be in and out. So we'll do what we can do with the draft, and then we'll. All right, and I'll just try to yes figure out how to keep track of the floor. Um, so we have a new draft that you all have. Do you have the draft? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Is um, it online? Oh, wait, it's draft 1.1. It's what, draft 1.1? Yeah, I, I do not. I have the glasses on, so I think we have the... I think I added, right after I two. printed it um, for discussion. Okay. Um, so it, I started out doing all the markup stuff, but it's... Uh, Bring advice, in particular. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no need to apologize. <laughs> Siri defined it as a <laughs> yes. She said, there's no need to apologize. <laughs> 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 the pop up in the phone. Ask her what I think about it. So, uh, so I started out doing this as a markup, showing you everything that was cross, you know, striking out everything. That, but it's so different that the whole thing ended up bright yellow. So I just started. It's basically a new document for the most part. Um, so section one on oversight of accountable care organizations. Most of what was in the bill as introduced is um, out. There would just be a requirement that in its in the Green Mountain Care Board's review of ACO budgets, the board, um, as part of its consideration of the uh, information on the ACO's administrative costs, uh, that would include the annual salaries and benefits by position for all of the ACO's management level employees. Um, and then a few new provisions added to the end of that in the budget review, the ACO's Efforts to whoops should be educate. This is unedited. Hopefully, I put that in there. We won't um, make any complaints. Educate providers on best practices and protocols for patient management, and the ACO's outreach efforts to educate providers and the public about the ACO's mission, its initiatives, and its impacts to date on population health. Then section two would be um, a requirement that the agency of 
Human Services in its contract, I'm sorry, uh, in actually DFR, in its contracts with a certified accountable care organization, the DFR would require, I'm sorry, coming from too many different places, yeah. let me slow down. In its contracts with a certified ACO, DIVA would require that the ACO consult with the Agency of Human Services, that's where they're in here, and its departments regarding public health and population health issues and to coordinate its services and initiatives in these areas with agency and departmental programming. So some of this was in, in requirements for Green Mountain Care Board certification. Um, one of their recommendations was to move it to a requirement that DIVA put it in its contracts with the ACOs. So that's what this would do. Section three is a new study um, on uh, regulation of ACOs and the future of the all pair model. This would direct the Joint Fiscal Office to contract with a qualified independent external organization to recommend to the General Assembly the most appropriate manner in which to regulate ACOs and to recommend modifications for future iterations of the all pair model. On or before January 15th, um, JFO would provide to the committees of jurisdiction, in this case I put um, the, this committee, finance and uh, health health care and the appropriations committees, the external organization's report which shall include recommendations regarding a model for regulation of ACOs that is feasible for Vermont, methods for increasing an ACO's transparency and accountability, including whether to require an ACO to establish a policy linking the compensation for management level employees to the ACO's financial and quality outcomes. Ways to ensure, I realize I'm totally not doing the thousand foot level. I don't know okay, if that's, that's what you okay. want or you want to okay. cut. You haven't seen this before either. Um, ways to ensure that an ACO fosters collaboration among its participating providers, including hospitals and community providers, and has established appropriate mechanisms for evaluating the extent to which these providers collaborate effectively. So that's a piece from the bill as introduced that was carried over to here. Ways to encourage the ACO to engage in ongoing and multi-year relationships with its participating providers and to promote the development of sustainable programs and initiatives whether and to what extent provider solvency should be considered in the distribution plan for shared savings realized by an ACO, whether ACO budget should be set on a multi-year basis, and I think there may be more to come, so I put in a little placeholder there, but the, this is to get some of these ideas from various places in here. Then we would move over to hospitals. This would require, as part of their budget submissions for hospital year, fiscal year 2021, so that's the one that's coming up this fall, that each hospital report to the Green Mountain Care Board the services that, that the uh, hospital provides, it should be, hospital provides at the highest cost. Um, and then on or before December 1st of this year, the board would compile that information and provide a comprehensive summary to this committee and house health care. So we might be able to predict what the highest cost is going to be this year. <laughs> no. um, sections. Five, six, and seven uh, are based on proposed language from the Green Mountain Care Board. So this is um, some information that the hospitals would, would provide to the board as part of the hospital budget review process. So um, this would add that the board, in addition to adopting uniform formats for certain um, data and information that they would include one for reimbursement. So they would adopt a uniform format for hospitals to use to report reimbursement information. Um, then in section six, as far as the information that hospitals have to file with the board for the budget review, it takes out a reference in subdivision A2 for the financial information to rates and charges because that gets fleshed out in more detail um, in a later new subdivision that comes on the top of page six, and that would be the hospital providing reimbursement information, including commercial rates, charges, fee schedules, reimbursement methodologies, proposed reimbursement increases or decreases, and rates as a percentage of Medicare or another benchmark determined by the board. Um, and then in section seven, an existing provision that requires all information filed in connection with hospital budget reviews to be made available to the public um, this would say, um, upon request, this would say um, 
provide a reference to in accordance with the Public Records Act and then give an exception, except that the following information shall be ex exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act and shall be kept confidential. First, information that directly or indirectly identifies individual patients or healthcare providers. That's kind of similar to um, the existing exception. Then reimbursement information submitted by a hospital pursuant to section 9454 of this subchapter, except that the board may disclose or release information publicly in summary or aggregate form if doing so would not disclose trade secrets as defined <coughs> in the Public Records Act. And financial information the board collects to address financial solvency issues. And then it gives a notwithstanding for the uh, the sunset provision, there's a sunset on Public Records Act exemptions, new Public Records Act exemptions. This says, notwithstanding that, this information will continue to be confidential. Um, and then it also would add a new subsection B, notwithstanding the open meeting law or any provision of this subchapter on hospital budgets. To the contrary, the board may examine and discuss confidential information outside a public hearing or meeting. Then we get to the Green Mountain Care Board itself. Um, so this language about a health care provider being on the Green Mountain Care Board is not changed from the version that you saw in the bill as introduced and the version that you passed out of the Senate last year. Um, section 9 is a replacement for the language having the Green Mountain Care Board do the extensive budget review for the DAs, SSAs, and preferred provider organizations. Um, this first carves out the provider preferred provider organizations, although it has somebody take a look at whether they should have their budgets reviewed in a later section. Um, but it would have the board do the kind of more limited review that they do for the Brattleboro Retreat and uh, accountable, I'm sorry, uh, ambulatory surgical centers. So this would have the board collect and review data from each community mental health and developmental disability agency designated by the Department of Mental Health or Dale pursuant to Chapter 207. Um, which may include data regarding a designated or specialized service agency's scope of services, volume, utilization, payer mix, quality, coordination with other aspects of the healthcare system, and financial condition, and I've added including solvency. The board's processes shall be appropriate to the designated and specialized services, service agency's scale and their role in Vermont's healthcare system, and the board shall consider ways in which the DAs and SSAs can be integrated fully into system-wide payment and delivery system reform. So a couple of little changes to um, differentiate them from the Brattleboro Retreat, um, also recognizing that there is some work underway to integrate them into payment and delivery system reform, but looking at ways to do so more fully. Um, huh? A lot. Um, then we have the Green Mountain Care Board uh, rate setting payment reform report. So this is the Green Mountain Care Board report back on things report. Some of these were um, based on language provided by the board um, in response to S290 as introduced. This would require by January 15th the board to report to this committee and uh, House Health Care and Senate Finance. First, the estimated personnel and other resources that would be necessary for the board to exercise its authority under 18 BSA section 9376, that's the Green Mountain Care Board rate setting statute, to set provider rates both for fee for service payments and under various fixed payment models, including global budgets for individual hospitals and global budgets for the hospital system as a whole. The projected impact of rate setting on the total cost of care under the all-payer model and on the sustainability of rural health care facilities. The manner in which specialty care shall be incorporated appropriately into the all-payer model. An analysis of the increases in, in health insurers' administrative expenses over the most recent five-year period for which information is available and a comparison of those increases with increases in the consumer price index. So this is taking out that health insurance um, rate review piece from the bill as introduced. And, and changing it into an analysis, and a recommendation regarding whether the board should conduct limited budget reviews for preferred provider organizations. So that's where that language goes in. It would require DIVA and the health insurers to provide to the board upon request data on their reimbursement amounts as needed for the board to comply with the requirements of subsection A, and that, that data shall be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act and kept confidential. 
Then we have a, a study looking at the role of the Green Mountain Care Board and others in health care regulation and health care reform. This would direct, again, the Joint Fiscal Office to contract with a qualified independent external organization to evaluate the structures and processes by which Vermont currently regulates and oversees the healthcare system and by which it fosters innovation in healthcare reform and to recommend redistribution of responsibility and authority as appropriate among the Green Mountain Care Board, the Agency of Human Services and its departments, the Department of Financial Regulation, the Office of the Attorney General, and other public and private stakeholders. <coughs> By January 15th, it would have the Joint Fiscal Office provide the report to the committees of jurisdiction, um, which shall include recommendations regarding, first, which entity or entities should be responsible for developing and implementing health care reform initiatives, conducting health insurance rate review, regulating health insurers, including ensuring insurer solvency, <coughs> reviewing the budgets of hospitals and other health care facilities and entities, certifying and overseeing accountable care organizations, issuing certificates of need, providing health insurance consumer protection, containing health care costs, monitoring and regulating health care safety, quality, and access, licensing and regulating health care providers and health care facilities, and setting equitable health care reimbursement rates both in and outside the all-payer model. Um, Second, whether it would be useful for purposes of health care cost containment for hospitals to report when they increase the commercial rates for certain health care services. And I think there's more to go in here, but I ran out of time. Um, I left some placeholder language in for Section 10 on health insurers um, about adding, about providing um, reimbursement rates to the Green Mountain Care Board and the Green Mountain Care Board keeping that confidential. The board had proposed that in connection with the hospital um, confidentiality language, but it didn't seem to make sense and to, to live in the hospital budget review uh, section. Then we get to the fair contract standards, which is largely unchanged from the bill as introduced, except I took out the part requiring or referring to the Green Mountain Care Board reviewing the contracts and rates, because uh, we took that out of the other part of the bill. Um, section 13. Another one I did not have time to do uh, would be added with an AHS work group working with the Department of Financial Regulation, the Green Mountain Care Board, and other interested stakeholders um, on a proposal for regulation and oversight of provider rates and contracts. This is something to take the place of that piece from the bill as introduced. And then just a section number change on the um, public employee attribution to the ACO and all care model report. And then effective dates would need, obviously, to be updated. Thank you. That's a lot of work. Mm. So good. Any questions for Jen right now? Sure, she said sure, no. Sure, all good. Sure, she says no. All of it. We need to we need to go through and read and um, well, time to digest. Yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, going through all the testimony that we've heard, and especially from the Green Man Care Board, and, and then thinking about what makes sense going forward, and after having spoken with Ina Bacchus and Secretary Smith and others, I think we're, we can make some progress on the bill. Um, so um, please read this. I know everybody in the room is very excited about it. <laughs> and, but but there are, there's a lot in here that I think um, responds to some of the concerns that exist about all payer uh, ACO and um, regulation overall. So I think maybe we'll just keep working. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Very good. And we will come back, just FYI. We'll, we'll keep going on the bill. Jen, you're in and out, right? Yeah. So we still have two more bills. So when you're in, at some point, we'll look at the other two bills. Um, but I wanted to just remind everyone that we have some time uh, toward the end of the week where we'll be spending a lot of time on this bill. So uh, there's time for everyone to go through it and with a fine tooth comb and we'll get together on that. So we have <coughs> DFR, Jill Rickard is here. Thank you for being here. We Thank appreciate it. I know that you probably looked at a 
prior iteration of the bill, right. and that's okay. Uh, we, we really want to hear your comments about rate setting and the work that you do with the insurance company and what toes we're stepping on when we start writing legislation. So thank you. Um, Jill Rickard, I'm the Director of Policy with DFR. I was actually prepared to comment on Section um, 5, uh, sorry, mm, I'm not sure which section it was actually. Section 9 of the bill, uh -huh. which would have given the Green Mountain Care Board authority to review and approve health care provider contracts. And my testimony is now sort of, like you say, no longer necessary because you've changed it to a work group um, to look at regulation and oversight of provider rates and contracts to include DFR, Green Mountain Care Board, and other stakeholders. And I think that's great because there was a bit of overlap if you were to have done what the original bill proposed. And may, if it's helpful, I can just tell you what our role in, in provider contract review is. So we have a regulation 2009-03, and section 5.3 of that regulation um, governs provider contracts, fiscal incentives, and disincentives. And there are certain substantive provisions that govern what may be and what is not permitted to be in a contract between a managed care organization and a provider. Um, Examples are that we prohibit providers from disclosing information to members about the contract or the plan that may affect decisions about the member's health. Um, we prohibit offering inducement to, to providers to forego medically necessary services. There are sections that say a contract must include requirements and responsibilities of the MCO and providers regarding administrative policies such as payment terms, confidentiality, agreement procedures, etc. So while we do not review provider contracts as a matter of course, we don't require these to be filed with us, we don't approve them, when there is an issue that is brought to our attention um, by our provider, for example, or by an MCO, we review the contract and determine whether it's in compliance with our regulation. And we would appreciate being able to continue doing that. And I wasn't quite sure what was intended by shifting the responsibility to the Green Mountain Care Board if DFR would retain that authority or what the intention was. So I do think the working group is a, is a good idea so we can work so out the whole universe. Out. Yeah. So, and you know, so the question I, I, I just had a, a question about, as you were speaking, you were talking about a managed care organization mm -hmm. and we're now moving into an era of accountable care organizations, mm -hmm. which are significantly different, I think. So. Is there any uh, thought on the part of DFR to modify language related to uh, how are we doing that? How are we looking at ACOs versus managed care? In this reg? I mean, I think there are probably a, a whole bunch of regs yeah. that we would need to look at in that area. And I'm not, I, I don't know if there have been conversations in our insurance department about that. I would be happy to talk to the right people and find out what, what they're thinking but I, I'm not sure I can answer the question right now. That would be very helpful of because course. I think there is a misperception out in the, uh, in, the, in the real world that managed care and ACO are the same, right. and they're absolutely not. Okay. So yep, I'd be uh, happy to I don't follow. know whether finance on this <laughs> what? what? So okay, that would you be like that? <laughs> yes, sir. but that would be very helpful. I mean, one of the one of the difficult things that we have is convincing people that uh, the all-payer model and the accountable care organization, which are going hand in glove, um, are valuable to our state as health care reform. So it would be helpful to have that information. Sure. And then your, your interest in, so DFR would be interested in, as far as you know at this point, participating in a uh, in a working group to sort out some of the issues that we hear right. from providers and from insurance companies and everybody mm -hmm. else yeah but, but, and also what who role? bears regulatory responsibility what role different yeah. stakeholders play in exactly. that process exactly I mean, yeah. it does get confusing mm -hmm. frankly and then when you have when you have folks going in to the Green Mountain Care Board looking for affirmation of a rate, and yet the whole analysis isn't there, mm -hmm. it's kind of tough. Yep. Okay. So, any short any and sweet. questions from? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have talked about the questions. Will you get back to us? I will. On that that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. 
So we have, I don't know, uh, Steve Howard is here, and then we've got uh, uh, HR, Beth and Clark are both here. And so Steve, do you want to come in and share sure. your thoughts, sure. please? Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. For the record, Steve Howard, I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont State Employees Association. And I take it you don't want my expertise on ACOs, so I'll go right to the study <laughs> section. <laughs> I'm an expert good. on study, although I didn't do much of it my, most of my career. Um, I have uh, learned in the last few months more than I ever thought I would about an ACO. Um, I think the BSEA, um, while we support studies, and we do think there is a need for additional study of the ACOs, the ACO model in Vermont, um, I will say that our um, relationship with the administration uh, through the Benefits Advisory Committee, which is a contractual committee that um, brings all the parties together, has been one of sort of mutual um, uh, cooperation on this issue as we examined whether or not it made sense for uh, state employees' lives to be attributed to the ACO. Um, so if I look at the language, and I think it's pretty much the same in this version as what it is, I think it's like, yeah. hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, what we would, uh, I think one concern we would have is if you're going to do a study and we, we are not opposed to additional study, that it be somebody other than the Agency of Human Services that conducts the study. Um, we would prefer that it be somebody completely independent of state government and of the administration with expertise in, AC, in the ACO and the healthcare model. Um, and mostly, you know, our, we've done a great deal of uh, uh, research and had a number of like months of conversations about this very issue. And our uh, Benefits Advisory Committee has advised the administration uh, that we did not want to be part of, uh, we did not want to be attributed to the ACO this year. And mostly it's because we want to see what happens. We want to see what the auditor's um, work uh, finds. Um, we just want to give it a little bit more time. Um, so this study would fit into that. Uh, we'd, we'd like it to be a little bit more independent. And this isn't mentioned in the bill, but I guess one of the things that our members, we just had a conference call about this last night, because this is like a favorite subject of the SEA. Um, one of the concerns we have isn't directly um, related to our health care plan. Um, we feel fairly confident that at least in the next year there won't be any negative, there wouldn't be any negative impact. And since we're not going to be attributed, there shouldn't be, there's, there's definitely not going to be. But if it were to be attributed, we feel fairly confident that that would be okay. The VSCA members' biggest concern about the ACO, ACO and one care in particular is about privatization. And it's about uh, what we see as the path being built to privatize the jobs that are in DIVA and jobs that potentially administer the Medicaid program. Um, we, I'm just going to raise that issue because it won't be considered this year, it won't be part of this bill, <laughs> but next year I can guarantee you I'll be back saying don't privatize DIVA, don't privatize the jobs that administer the Medicaid program. We don't want one care to manage those programs. We want state employees to manage those programs. So I just want to put that on the record because that is the biggest concern state employees have. Okay. Um, well, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a good concern, understanding, of course, that it would take a waiver and an act of the federal government in order to make that possible, and yeah. right now that is sort of like... It's not going to happen anytime it's soon, but happen. it is a concern that they have. <laughs> anytime soon. Right. right. Yeah. You're right. Okay. So that's as much as I have to say. In can, uh, so uh, the question I have to ask of you is, and you're saying, let's wait and see what happens, mm -hmm. and then, so I have a comment, and then something to think about. If we wait to see what happens, one of the, one of the things that has to happen is that attributable lives reach scale for the, for the, for the program, and if it, if it doesn't, it falls apart. So we're in a catch-22, mm -hmm. because the way we can reach scale in government is through um, government-sponsored programs. Mm -hmm. And if we, we, what we can't do, but what the insurance companies are really working very hard on, and as is the ACO, is bringing lives in from ERISA plans. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, is, that is a huge issue. I just want you to know that yeah. having attributable lives, reaching scale, 
is the only way that we're going to be able to validate the work that's going on. Sure. So, put that into the, the bee in the bonnet, and I, uh, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just maybe continue yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. The other thing is, <clears throat> I, I don't know how, but maybe there's a way to think about some kind of a pilot program that encourages or has um, state employees involved attributing their lives, uh, short something that demonstrates mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this isn't going to do what we all might think right, it could right. so. I, I certainly understand that, uh, Madam Chair, and I, and I respect that. I think you'll um, appreciate that because the state health insurance plan has been so well managed, and it's been really a cooperative relationship with right. the administration. We don't want to change unions. that. Yeah, right. And, and you know, for the last couple of years, we haven't had a premium increase. That's probably not going to last much longer. But right. we are very concerned about anything that might upset that apple cart. Too. We got it. <laughs> think about the things that you know uh, achieving scale yeah. think about a pilot possible possible uh, in the short term and then long term some of the concerns that you have about privatization I think are shared mm -hmm. so it's not something that we look forward to at least from sure. my perspective sure absolutely okay. I, I do think there is oversight and regulation but there is not uh, privatization mm -hmm. in, in the future me. Good. We'll see what happens. We're glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank huh? you very much. I hadn't thought about that. I, I'm trying to figure out how you give Medicaid dollars to a private organization without going through some horrible. Yeah, our concern is when you have as much power as the ACO appears to have and UVM appears to have, and you have the, a will to do that, there's usually a way to follow. Oh, okay, so we're it. on a different page there because yeah. I don't see the ACO power at all. They're, they're yeah. a healthcare <laughs> providing system. So we, we need to talk further about sure. that. And that's part of the education piece that's in the bill, yeah. the ACO's responsibility to start yeah. saying what they are and what they are not. So we, when you look at, when we look at the ACO, I think people are looking at the hospitals having all this control. In reality, it's control of about $62 million out of billions of dollars. Absolutely. So it's not a big yeah. thing. So I won't go on my soapbox right now. No, I understand. So. We, do, we do think the, the provisions about administrative costs and salaries are helpful. That Good. was initially when we started this discussion. Uh, one of the concerns was exactly. how much uh, will salaries, yeah. how much are salaries. And it's not a huge amount of money, but we think those are, are positive uh, okay. additions. The biggest thing for us is to ensure that we reach scale and that our small community hospitals can maintain solvency so that we don't lose rural health care. Yeah. And that includes all the docs that are out there yeah. and all the um, DAs and SSAs. Yeah. When you start thinking about what's before us in terms of health care over the next couple of months, we don't want to <clears throat> lose what we have. Absolutely. So anyway. We agree there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you very I much. I like your testimony very much, but we're going to have to think about pilot, maybe. Think of something. Think of something. We're always here. open to having a conversation with you about that. Okay, so. good. All right. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Thanks. You. All right. Now, so Beth and Clark, do yeah. you both want to testify together? That would be fantastic. Could we free up a chair? Oh. Maybe someone could sacrifice a chair. Oh, yeah. It won't. It's only one that testifies. I don't. I don't think it'll be that long. So. <laughs> Sugar is not there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Beth Fastigi. I'm the Commissioner of Human Resources for the State of Vermont, and Clark Collins is our Deputy Director of Benefits and Wellness for the State of Vermont. And you're probably more familiar with him in this committee than you are with me. I've been around a while, but I believe this is my first time in this committee. Um, Do you know everybody? I think so, yes. All right, good. Yeah. Um, we'll have to have you back tomorrow. That's right, <laughs> yeah. Well, I probably not because this is not my area of expertise, but um, we have been, and it is Clark's area of expertise, but I mean, my responsibility is managing the state employees' health care program. We um, bid out um, our health care contracts. 
we um, manage the funds, we um, work with the VSEA very closely and seeing what the members want. So, our, so, so my job is really, it's managing that. Um, last year, was it last year, we put out all of our healthcare contracts out to bid and we had some very successful bidding. We were able to actually um, really, I would say save, but have a lot of future cost avoidance by rebidding those contracts, which we're really excited about. We uh, reduced our um, OPEB, our retirement health care liability, by over $200 million by rebidding those contracts and making some tweaks to those plans. Um, so we're really pr actually proud of that and the work we've done. And as um, Steve mentioned from the BSEA, we've had pretty good success about um, not increasing the costs of our plan over the past couple of years. And as you did mention, we probably will be increasing that this year. Um, one of the things that we worry about is we increase costs at the same time. Uh, we joined um, One Care would be that employees would think it would be as a result of One Care. Well, it really isn't. I mean, there is a natural rise to health care costs. And with the um, lowering of the cost last year, that kind of gave us a jump down. But we still will go up. So I just want to say that you know, we can't, we don't expect that we will have zero increases for the ongoing period there. Um, with respect to S290, obviously uh, we are not the administration experts on that. Um, we would have a very small part in that, um, on the reporting part of that, working with um, Agency of Human Services and discussing employees' lives into the health care plan, what it's going to take to attribute employees' lives. Um, in general, I'm not big on reports, and I don't think this administration is big on reports, and we prefer not to have additional reports. Um, that's that's always the goal. But for our part, and it would be would be would be manageable. And we are, as we have been exploring um, what it would mean for state employees to join um, to attribute the state's lives to um, to one care and all pair model. We've really not all, but <laughs> we've really um, learned a lot. And um, actually, and worked um, particularly with Ina Backus to kind of understand what it means and the, and what you're um, talking talking about, Senator Lines, about the importance of scale and the importance of attributing employee lives there. And um, I think, and Steve mentioned a little bit the journey that we've been on um, for the past several months, really learning about One Care and One Care, and both Blue Cross Blue Shield and our insurance provider have been fantastic about providing information, making their employees available so that we really understand the model. It's because what they came up with on how to attribute employees' lives really enables us to join the model with really any very little fiduciary risk to our plan. But it's kind of confusing and complicated, especially when you're coming from a position of just kind of going off on your own. So I think it's taken a lot of time and research on behalf of both um, myself and um, other people in Department of Human Resources as well as um, members of the Benefits Advisory Committee at the VSEA to really understand what this would mean to attribute the lives to the plan. I'm at the point where I think that it's, I don't think there's a risk. I think employees could really benefit from it. Um, just having their lives get the benefit of the um, coordination of care. I want our employees to have that, but I also respect um, the work that um, the VSEA and the Benefits Advisory Committee is doing, and they're recommending to wait a year, and I would really like to honor that because I do value our relationship with them. This process has been very, um, very helpful, I think, in building trust again between the union and, and, um, and the administration. And we want to use that and build that um, con to continue to talk about healthcare issues and other employee issues. So I think that's really where we are. The model that um, that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and um, One Care have come up with, and also the employees of both of those organizations, and really, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty and explaining how much money is actually at risk, which is not a lot of money and it really seems like it would be a win-win for our employees like we win either way almost so it was it's very it's a very um it works very well for us and it was i think pretty creative almost almost um it was like oh that makes so much sense and then the other thing that we've done is we've um <laughs> we've worked with um we've worked also with the vsea and blue cross blue shield to try to get language to amend our contract so that would happen so i think we're also there so we've really paved the way to 
have um, state employees join in the plan, and we're really excited to be able to have employees experience the benefits of that. When I um, mention it just to employees that haven't been part of it, and I said, well, what we'd really like to do is do this, and they're like, oh, we don't, we don't want to do that. I can't even, I have a hard time even getting a doctor's appointment. So it's the whole healthcare system, I think, as you mentioned, cool, like the whole healthcare system, they think it's just this one little piece of it, and having a hard time finding a doctor and having all these other things, or they don't like the hospital, or they don't like this, that's, I think there's a big education piece, um, and I think a better way to do it is when we go in, have our employees be receptive to that rather than fighting it and, and having that negative, um, additional negative, um, hearing additional negative things publicly about it because I think it's really more of a lack of, a lack of information and a lack of understanding about what it is and what it would mean. So I think that that's kind of where we are at this point. Um, okay, so I, what I'm hearing you say is in pretty much agreement with what we heard Steve Howard say. Um, well, right. except if I was in my head and I didn't have to worry about what our employees thought, I probably would have just done it. But <laughs> it's really important for me in my job to think about our employees and our relationship with our employees. Yeah. So yeah. so I think that that's, that's where we are. But yeah. And I did want to respond to you about your, um, you had mentioned a pilot program. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we are working into the contractual language uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield is the ability to, uh, to back out uh, so that if we do attribute our lives, it is not a permanent decision. Right. Uh, so sort of along those lines, a pilot program doesn't necessarily have to be something official as much as contractually we are able to back out uh, if we find that it's not working well for the plan. Okay. Um, so, have you have have you how far have you thought about having that contract in place? I mean, obviously, the negotiations are going on now, right? Yep. Right, so it's ongoing. I would say that we are near completion of a contractual amendment that would allow us to attribute our lives. Uh, but as, um, as we've mentioned and as, as Steve mentioned, um, it appears that 2020, uh, it might not happen in 2020, but in terms of going effective as soon as we can, we, we should have the amendment pretty much hammered out so that we can go in once we're able to. And so as I'm listening to this, I think of, I said, I mentioned a cash 22 earlier, and so it's the attributable, lot, attributable lives. And then if we, as Steve Howard's not here, but he suggested, well, he wants to wait and see what the auditor says. Well, if we don't have a uh, scale, then we're gonna fail. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, um, so, and I wish Steve were here because um, it's very simple to poke holes in a system if we don't allow for the system to go forward. And I encourage you to work as assiduously as you can to, um, with folks. And, and we, I think all of us will be trying to talk with others, but the education piece is amazingly important. Um, I don't know whose shoulders that falls on. Is it the state? Well, I, Is it the ACO? I, mean, who, I think that who um, that? that's the, I, I don't know who it is, but I do know that the, I really have to compliment the VSCA and really for digging in, really under, trying to understand the model and how it work and how it would impact the plan. And, um, and I think that's really when I heard um, what people are saying, there was like, their, I think their biggest concerns about it have been have been met, and it's just really it's just that extra plunge and that jump in the lake. Like it's the hesitancy of change, where it was where we is as I think really where they are at this point. It's like give us some more time to think about it, and so that, and I think we're going to really be there. So I think that's what that's kind of what we heard heard around the table from members. Like they're they're very close. It's still just the. So, and we're in year three right now, putting together the behavioral piece of our waiver. And then we're thinking about the next 2.0 waiver. And if we don't reach scale, we aren't having anything. The whole system will fall apart. We will be back at 
ground zero. So I put that also into your heads, and I will talk with Steve personally about the value of, of uh, moving ahead somehow. A pilot program, I don't, how, can you separate out primary care and the contract? Blah, I'm not. I guess not. So, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that no it's... No way to do that. Anyway, it's too late to think about that right now. <laughs> anyway, but I understand your need to have more time. I understand the cold feet issue, or the cold water issue. <laughs> Uh, nobody wants to go swimming in March, so okay. okay. We appreciate your coming in and questions. I would say any work that you're doing with your benefits advisory committee um, might want to meet more frequently. Anyway, I don't know if you can do that. So we've been. You, generally, it's a quarterly meeting, Clark. It and was we, a quarterly meeting, but during the process of evaluating the, the impact of the plan, we were meeting almost weekly for a few months. So, Good idea. Yeah, so we I should. mean, listen, for me, if, if the concern is privatization, why don't we just take all this money and pass it through DIVA? Huh. That's the first that I've actually heard about privatization on the, you know, this that we have. We even talked about that with the benefits advisory committee. I haven't heard that either. They're concerned. They're, you know, they're just concerned about their health care plan, their health care plan that they're very, um, they take a lot of pride in and they're very, they, they have should. a lot of ownership in it. So, so that's where they, that's, that's kind of where they are, but they, they seem to understand that, um, that, um, it's 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 probably the best way to move forward. So, not losing benefits is important. <laughs> yes, we get that. But they don't they 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 understand what it is now, but I don't think they understand the value of what it could be. So I think that's the, really the education piece of what they what what employees are really losing out in by not attributing their lives, and I think that's what we have to work on accumulating um, okay. communicating. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks for being here. I think. <laughs> no, seriously, thank you very much. Okay. So, committee, think creatively. <laughs> We've got to, you know. That always gets me. I know. I'm very concerned about the idea that having an external audit by the auditor's office is going to solve all the problems when we haven't even met the scale and achieved the goals for the all pair. And I like the audit. <laughs> so, um, is there a way for me to contact Sam and Sue or her ETA? Are we going to get a... Uh, we need to talk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Before we do that, just very briefly, on S202, I think, Dory, did you put, did you put, you didn't put the test, the letter that we received from, I have a letter, don't go away yet. The Green Mountain Care Board. Yes, we should put that. That's yeah, that should go up. And then um, that's on 252. That indicates that the Green Mountain Care Board has already put together planning for the um, inclusion of PT and chiropractic. And I think that's it. Then. On S-252, I don't know 
about you, but I'm, I've had a lot of little emails. Oh, yes. Mm. And I so finally, I, just, I got a book. Did everybody else get a book? Yes. No, I haven't gotten the book. No, oh, it's oh, in your, well, it's, well, it's in your uh, oh, I know. it came to my house. Okay, okay, well, you can have one of your nice. I got one of my house. Okay, mine's in my box here. What is it? It tells us all about new and inspiring. PR, regenerative. Yeah, regenerative medicine. So, so what I understand is that the word went out from testimony that we were covering things that the Food and Drug Administration doesn't cover and approve, and that we didn't know what we were doing at all. Yes. And so that has been implied and explicitly stated in our my response, <laughs> and we're impacting their their um, ability to make a living. But all we this is a, a disclosure. We're not banning it. So, um, you, circular art, art you did see things. my reply, right? The, my single paragraph yes. reply. I, yes. I thought that. We're and considering then, it, and we will. And right, and so yep. we will not violate any state or federal laws or rules. Or okay. So, um, Jen did uh, has tried to identify disinterested objective. Uh, information yeah. so that we can move forward on 252. I, I love the uh, suggestion of the lawyers in Florida. In Florida. Yeah. Did you read that one? Yeah. I, I stopped reading. reading. I, just, I, I stopped reading them not because I'm not interested. It's because they're, they're getting into uh, complexity and scientific complexity right. uh, for which I'm not qualified. And that's lay. I don't know if you saw my response to 20 minutes. We are lay people. Right. And it doesn't mean that we make high priests out of the scientists and say, well, this guy has the credentials and he says this, so we believe him. Well, we but on the other hand, it's, it's, we're not scientists. I'm not going to enter into debate with these guys either. I think what we need is some guidance. We're, as lay people, we do have a responsibility to be scientifically literate enough to understand the experts. So I need a little bit of competent expert guidance on how to interpret all this. You know, and even going through uh, Dr. Weiss's um, PowerPoint, it, you've got to go through it several times and listen to it so that you become fluent. I think that, you know, that's the, that was the education that yeah. was brought to us. Yeah. The key here is what is it that FDA does regulate and what is it that FDA does not regulate. And okay. so, S202. Yep. Chiropractic PT. And I just asked uh, Dory to put the Green Mountain Care Board information up that said that they had already gone through and included <coughs> solo chiropractic and PT. It's up. It's up. So refresh. Refresh. Under about none. None. There it is. Yeah. Okay. So what you, Jennifer Kirby, Legislative Council. Um, what, what are you looking for in this bill? This is the bill that would um, require chiropractic and does at your amendment at least would require chiropractic and physical therapy services um, in silver and bronze qualified health benefit and reflective health plans the silver and bronze level to have a co-payment that does not exceed 125 percent of the co-pay for the primary care that's right and so the concern was that it would take a lot of analysis to make this happen and what we've heard is that the analysis has already taken place. Right, I think right. I think this was included in the um, plan design for the plans that were approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. Right. But that doesn't limit it forever, right? No. That doesn't. No. But if we no. do this bill, it would limit it forever until right. we do it. Right. Right. Until we did another right. one. Right. Until you changed right. it or, or not was it? Right. Yes. That is okay. That's where we are. Okay. All right. 
so we know where we are. So we can come back to this for discussion and vote when Jen is probably in the room. Okay. I don't want to keep her here for nope. that. And so then let's go to 252. All right. And this is um, a new draft. Yes. And we've been talking about the pains that we've been under. 3.1, is that right? Yes. 3.2. 3.2. Yeah, 3.2. Okay. I forgot. Yeah. And we've been hearing uh, information that said that this bill is totally against, goes against federal everything. Stem cells. Uh, 252. So the change that I'm, so the last version you looked at uh, would have amended the definition of stem cell product to include um, in addition to homologous use of minimally manipulated cell or tissue products, uh, also include whole blood, blood derivatives, and blood components. Uh, I think that's what you've heard the, the most concern about and whether those are things that require FDA approval in the first place. Uh, so that would be struck in this new draft. Uh, and then there's just a fixing a typo on page two, and I think the rest of it is the same as the last. So to clarify then, the FDA does not give approval for the use of whole blood, blood derivatives, or blood components. I'm not sure I can say that with any certainty. I have to tell you I'm not an expert in this area, and I don't I don't know which of these types of, of products requires FDA approval. I've been trying to find out. Um, and these are what is referred to as platelet-rich plasma? Uh -huh. I get whole or blood from you. Do you know what whole blood is? Whole blood is... Everything. Um, plasma, 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 blood yeah. cells, yeah. and all the proteins and everything else that's in the plasma. So whole blood is everything. So if you have blood components, then blood components are could be um, clotting factors, hormones, everything. So this is like, this is like, stem cell products in the cells tissue city. So it takes blood out of the whole discussion. Literally. But are we hoping right. in we have the Red Cross and Yeah, we don't want them to have to. Now we have to run upstairs. Okay. So like, so Jen, yes, two bills. yes. So can I ask you this question before you leave? Is there um, how can we find out I'm gonna bring David Hurley up here in a minute. How can we find out The answer to this kind of That's a great question. I would invite other people to see you later. Thank you. So I appreciate it. Well, I, yes. I think our, I have used on other issues like vaccinations. I've used the Department of Health as for expert. But now there are people who will say, well, that you shouldn't because the Department of Health is part of the plot. Well, we did but, send, I mean, one I did, way or another, you're going to be stuck with FYI, that. FYI, I did send a, a note out to the Department of Health before the break. They didn't respond to me. They said they were working on it. But apparently, they have responded to Jen. So I don't know the answer. So they didn't respond to me when and I sent that And they're dealing with other things right now. So, so yeah. 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 So now this I'm going to not have David Hurley he come up, because he might be able to give us shine some light. Yeah. Do you mind? No, no, yeah, no. that'd be great. Thank you. I'm a congressman and have their staff person call me after you. Hi, I'm David Hurley, Executive Director of the Board of Medical Practice. And um, so I don't know that I can provide you a medical answer to your question, but um, I responded on, on behalf of the uh, Commissioner of Health to, to, to Jen because um, the uh, he and, and Dave Englander were, were very busy with all the, the yes, uh, other are. issues. Um, and you know, when, when I, the more I thought about it, um, I, this really isn't a legal problem, a, a medical problem, it's a legal issue. And I, what occurred to me was we were going about this in the wrong way. So the treatment told that. The, the <laughs> treatments, well, let, let me see if I can yeah. take a minute and explain my, my theory. The treatments that, that we were trying to add back in here, there's a concern that um, some Vermonters may be 
taken advantage of because they're being sold the reintroduction of their, their own blood as a stem cell treatment is really what it boils down to. And I went online and looked at some of the, the marketing and it, it's, um, you know, it, it, it talks about taking somebody's blood and putting it through a centrifuge essentially and reintroducing it and it talks uh, about, you know, getting your stem cells excited and so the, you know, the, the concern is that um, patients, uh, consumers are, are being sold what they think is stem cell treatment, and you know, there's this aura around stem cell treatment as being the the uh, the next greatest thing in, in medicine, and going to be able to cure all kinds of things that we can't cure now. Um, and so, rather than, and and you know, what our concern really is is about I think people being given the impression that this is stem cell treatment when it's not. And to me, the problem was we're, we're trying to, you know, clump this in with the definition of stem cell products and then say you need to make this disclosure. I think that what we need to do is leave the stem cell products, you know, on its own and you need to make the disclosure if you're, if you're selling people stem cell products as it's defined there and we have a definition we can use and then have a second approach that says, you know what, no matter what you're doing, if you're marketing a treatment and you're talking about stem cells and that there's going to be a benefit and you refer to stem cells, you need to make the disclosure that it is not an FDA approved stem cell treatment and that stem cell treatments are required to be approved by the FDA. So in other words, just, you know, we're not saying you can't do this, you can't sell people the idea of taking their own blood out and putting it back in. You just need to let them know it's not a stem cell treatment if you're talking about stem cells when you're trying to sell them that. Because I was trying to figure out how is the stem cell? I mean, yeah. It, it's not. And, and to me, the problem was, you know, we're concerned that people are calling the stem cells. And then the law, we're saying, we're defining this as a stem cell treatment, which is the last thing we want to do. Right, right. We agree with that. Okay. I, mean, I was reading the thing on the horse doping scandal and yeah. what that thing did to your blood started to sound an awful lot like some of the claims being made for the enriched blood, you know, the, the, the increase your endurance and did. And I'm saying, okay, um, uh, don't talk about it. Red cells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I'm troubled by how skillfully pseudoscience betrays okay. itself. I, so, yeah. I, I don't know if everyone, I, I get something pretty much every month called Climate news from the Heritage Foundation. The Heritage Foundation is not a scientific institute. No. It's a political thing. And right wing, did they have a right to their right wing political newsletter? But it poses as science. And it's got graphs, and the authors have PhDs. And it, you think you're looking at science. Yeah. You're looking at advertisements for the oil companies, is what you're looking at. But it's, and then I get scolded by constituents that I'm being dogmatic because I trust <laughs> the established science. And you know, I'm being arrogant. I'm pretending to be a scientist. Of course, I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm saying I'm not I'm a policymaker and I need some scientific advice to make science based uh, policy. So that's what I'm worried about with, with, with some of these. Yes, stem cells is a, a, so, it's going to cure everything, uh, and it, it you're being led to think you're getting stem cell treatment and you're not. Then I think you need to know that. So the you language twenty thousand. The language that uh, we have in front of us on um, 
as 252. Have you seen the latest language? That crosses out and whole blood derivatives and blood components and leaves the definition as it is stem cell products that was there previously. Does that satisfy the concerns that you were expressing? Well, uh, it gets because it's only stem. Cells. It gets part way there. I think that we we need to add in additional language that that gets at a disclosure based on the the representation of stem cells being involved with the treatment. And I, I just and there's one other thing I really need to say about that is I I did bring you know I was part of a, a working group um, that discussed this, and Jill Abrams, who's an assistant AG in the Consumer Protection uh, Office, she was on that group, and I shared this idea with her, and um, I don't want to put words in Jill's mouth, but her first impression um, was that, you know, it made sense, but that it needed some scrutiny, and I don't want to speak for the AG's office, and I know that Charity Clark has, has been here testifying. So I think that you know you'd need to look at obviously you know is it is you know can you make that disclosure requirement based on the mention of, of stem cells? But um, you know that's from from me for, from my point of view as someone who's concerned about the um, you know legitimate and, and appropriate practice of medicine. I, I think that that's a good way to get at it. Uh, so go ahead. Just so in here where it, we talk about stem cell products has the same meaning as. It, is that the definition that you would, uh, are talking about? Or because you, stem cells has a definition. And what we want to say is you're not that definition is what I understand what you just said. No, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to do two things because some, some of the things they are representing as stem cell treatments and representing that, that don't you know they don't need FDA approval or whatever and and so that I think that's a, an established federal definition that's it's out there and I don't have any issue with with using that and taking that as as one part of the approach but then there's this well other I, I, class I, 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 I'm referring to the first part of the approach yeah. does that yes. accomplish yeah. that to say to them you can't be calling yourself stem cell if you don't need this. I, I, th I think it is. Okay. okay. And then in terms of the language for the other piece, is that something that um, you can send along to us, to Jen? I, I, gave, I gave Jen Can, you, uh, can you send me a email. copy of that so we can yeah. look at it? I it, think it was pretty informal and needs her magic touch. I know. But, yeah. Okay. I think she read it to me, but it would be good to have, to have see it. Okay. Uh, that would be great. Maybe, um, Okay, and then we'll have to talk, when, when Jen is in the room, we'll have to talk about uh, how we want to proceed with that. Have we talked to the AG? To the AG's office? The AG yeah. was yeah. triangulated yeah. with that. Yeah. Right, so we need to have the AG back in on this as well. So what do you mean triangulated? Triangulated. Uh, Department of Health. Yeah. Ledge Council. AG. Oh, okay. They're all... Right. In touch with one another. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So there we are. I hesitate to say, does anyone want to comment on 202 or 252? But I'll go to 252. I'm looking. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wait until we hear back from. Uh, our ledge council and the AG's office and try to put something together on this. Okay? Okay. Do we want to go to two So then let's, uh, let's put that one aside. We'll come back to that. And we will look at 252, which is draft 3.2. Discussion. You mean two, two o two. Two o two. Two o two. That yeah. is the chiropractic PJ comments. I discussion. I've said before. I have concerns about. We could be looking at some major increases in costs. Other 
places that to in perpetuity say, unless we change the law, you guarantee this rate. I'm not comfortable with doing that. I think we've already put in law a range. You can't go any higher than 150. I think that the diabetes bill is on the floor. Uh, we've got, and we tend, to, every one of these is a good cause, and taken in isolation, they're all good causes. But somebody's got to sit down and balance those. Is chiropractic really more important if you've got to decide where you've got to make adjustments than primary care in a flu outbreak? I, I, I just don't think that we're qualified to make, I think we, well, we are. I mean, yeah, the Mount of Care Board has right. come across with their recommendation. Right. So, but that's for this year, right? I think that's fine, but I don't like giveth and taketh away. You don't yeah. like the long term. Either. I don't like. Yeah, I. I just think it's it once we've done this with another a, a, a number of things, and people come in. It's I starting to have sympathy for appropriations. <laughs> Taken in isolation, everything should be done. Yeah. Well, but uh, it's a finite. People don't like paying taxes, so everything can be done. Yeah, it, it's finite. Um, choices have to be made, and I just don't like tying our hands. I mean, it was egregious when the copay was more than the cost of the treatment, but we fixed that. And. I'm just not, I'm, I'm not comfortable with time. Momentum is a very powerful force. Mm -hmm. And once the thing is in. Yeah. It's in. Would you want a grandfather? Not grandfather, sunset. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, not grandfather. No, because next year will be another one and we'll do another well we've got at least well three unless four. there's a bill that's going to allow for a comprehensive analysis and send it to a working group i mean s290 is starting to look at some of the rate stuff uh in its own way and uh, if does the insulin bill have a comprehensive analysis built into it that do I any think that's what's going to be done um there's a study of having the hospitals provide it at their cost plus 340B cost. Okay. Um, that's what's being added why I get passed over today. Okay. Um, but that one, insulin, the lack of insulin is life threatening. Mm -hmm. the, the lack of chiropractic is. Well. PT can be yeah. PT. cause people to be immobilized for the rest of their lives. Yeah. But I think that's what we've set up the Green Mountain Care Board for. And every time we start end running them, we tie their hands a little tighter. They don't set farms. Well, it's interesting that because this bill came forward, then the board went ahead and did the work. So if this bill were here, would that have happened? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know. So I'm, you know, I think we've worked hard on this, and I think we've looked at it in the past, and we're adding PT into the legislative uh, decisions. Um, and it goes, it drops it down from 150% to 125, which is actually a savings compared to what is currently in legislation. So it does change legislation and it moves it back down. If we don't, it'll stay up there. No, it's at 125. It's been at 125 since we took action. But it has a range. It could go up. It could go up. This will limit that. It will set it at 125. Right. But next year, it won't go up. No, but 
maybe it needs to so we can bring down the cost of something else. Like primary care. I have the no co-pays in primary care. It, we are just doing this kind of mirror vision, or you know, just with blinders on, or this tunnel vision, and not looking at all the other moving parts. And I just think it's dangerous. Okay. So, is there uh, any? So, are there other comments to be made? Well, I think Sarah Cummings makes a lot of sense. To be honest, it's hard for us to to do it if we take things in isolation. You know, we've got the what a primary care bill. We've got care primary care no out there pays. too. Yeah, we just did the insulin, and mm -hmm. it's like yeah. you know, um, it, that's why the Green Mountain Care Board is. That's if we're going to do the job, then save a lot of money and get rid of the Green Mountain Care Board. Okay, do they affect Diva? Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? I've made the same speech a dozen times. So oh, good. I'll spare you this just, time. just the give us the essence. <laughs> okay, that we the big choice is: do you, is healthcare a public function or a private sector function? We've decided it's a private sector function. Be driven by market forces. The market forces lead us into all sorts of places we don't want to be. So there, the government, which won't run healthcare access, does manipulate the outside system so that it doesn't do the nasty things market forces want it to do. In other words, we have a market system weighed down with liberal bells and whistles that work against the market forces that drive the market system in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy <coughs> way to do it. And it, in my view, is it can never work. I get bored. Right. I get bored with it because I, my sense is it's going nowhere. It can't go anywhere. We can join the rest of the civilized world and, uh, <laughs> and do what all industrialized democracies are already doing and have this be a public function, or we can just continue to spin our wheels and have studies. And so on this bill, Senator 202? I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll vote for it. I always vote for the damn thing. So it's just the, it's the, if it's the best deal we can get for the people. No, really. If it's the best deal we can get for the gonna people. going to add another then. whistle. <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel that way. Yeah. Any comments, Senator Westman? I, it's more important for me to have um, insulin in primary care than it is chiropractors. And I um, appreciate what they do. And I don't feel real comfortable putting a box around just this. I generally agree with that. OK. Well, I, if you've ever had lower back trouble like I have, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it, is, heroes. it isn't important. Um, if you don't have your insulin, you're dead. Point well taken. Well, the concern I have is we put, you know, we, we make this lower, but they may have to raise something else somewhere else. I, 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 don't, I don't know where it is. Yeah, I don't need it. Where's it in? We need alignment. Aside for now, it sounds like it's not re not ready for prime time. There go my emails. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy your reading. Um, and we'll come back to 252 when we have Jen in the room. We can't do that without her. That's a that's a big lift. So tomorrow. <coughs> wait, is Mark? Yeah, Mark. Is here? I'm right here, sir. Oh, thank heavens. <laughs> That's Thank a, you. That's a tough act to You're follow. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, my husband is at his, uh, at his physical therapist. Oh, my God. All right. Thank you for making yourself available. I know that it was nip and tuck, but we, Thank you for accommodating this schedule. I appreciate so this it. So is, this is back, back to the future of S290 and a section of S290 that, um, section 12, uh, which includes um, study. So what's yes. your after? What are you working? 
the more recent study of S290, it's the same on both uh, I trust you have copies of my testimony or do you need it? Yes, we have copies. Right, thank you. That was good. We are electronic. Do you know everyone? Probably not, so. I think I do, but it wouldn't hurt to go around. Go, go ahead. Ed Cox from Washington, Washington County. Rich Westman from Wyoming County. Jenny Elias, Chittenden County. Debbie Ingram, Chittenden County. Dick McCormick, Windsor, Sun. Uh, so, so thank you for being here, and we'll listen to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, so my name is Mark Hage. I'm the Director of Benefit Programs at Vermont NEA. Some of you may also know that I am a long-standing trust administrator for the Vermont Education Health Initiative, VHI. I have been in that position since late 2001, but I am not testifying today on behalf of VHI. I am speaking exclusively in my capacity as a staff member of Vermont NEA. And my testimony will be limited to Section 12, Subsection A of S290, which, as you know, calls for a report to be generated under the auspices of the Agency of Human Services with participation by Vermont NEA and DSEA to explore relevant issues connected to the future attribution or not of state employee lives and public school employee lives to One Care Vermont and the all-payer model. Now, Laura Soares, who's a fellow member of the VHI management team, has provided this committee with a statement from VHI explaining its reasons for why it deferred attributing school employee lives, active school employee lives, to One Care Vermont in 2020. And contrary to a Vermont Digger report, I have to clarify that unanimous support for that statement came from the VHI Board of Directors, not Vermont NEA. Gotcha. Right. Vermont NEA at present does not yet have a position on One Care Vermont or the all-payer model. It may choose to do so or adopt such a position in the future, but at present the union believes that looking to VHI for guidance and direction in 2020 is the most appropriate course to determine if and when and under what terms active public school employees should be attributed to One Care Vermont. Respectfully, we believe that the public school community will be better served by allowing VHI to continue undertaking its own rigorous analysis of One Care Vermont, which has been authorized by our board of directors, than the generation of a separate report, which is called for in S290. And let me elaborate on that position. If school employees were attributed or not to One Care Vermont next year, they would continue to have access to the same health care plans the same Rx formularies and pharmacies, and the same doctors and other healthcare professionals in the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont medical network. So when it comes to school employees' access to care, their experience as patients, and the, their evaluation of the relative value of their healthcare benefits, those are three areas of inquiry that are cited in Section 12 of S290. Those do not hinge definitively at present on the question of ACO attribution, because again, they're linked to VHI's benefit plans and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's medical networks. In fact, I suspect that most patients today have no idea if they are attributed to the ACO. They now, they do get letters, they that is letters. right. <laughs> now, it's true. It's true that good care coordination uh, facilitated by a team of doctors who are attributed to One Care Vermont would enhance the medical experience of the patient and conceivably increase the value of health insurance in their minds. But the same would be true if they got good care coordination outside the ACO. So in either scenario, we wouldn't need an outside study to conclude that excellent care coordination is a worthy end. That is certainly a point I will never contest nor does Vermont NEA. Now, when it comes to health outcomes, I don't see how an AHS-facilitated report, one that would be released, if I recall correctly, in mid-October of this year, could predict or assess how health outcomes in the future, for better or worse, would be affected by the attribution of school employee lives to the ACO. 
based on the timing of the Green Mountain Care Board's annual quality review of the ACO, it's my understanding that the 2019 quality results will not be in the public domain until at least October, when the proposed, proposed report and S290 must be completed. In fact, last night I visited the Green Mountain Care Board website and was reminded that a very long and complicated report on the cost and quality metrics of the 2018 ACO performance was dated November 20th of 2019. So the 2019 results are not going to be available to us until the report called for an S290 needs to be released. So this means producing the report would be limited as we are now to the most recent history of the ACO's quality results. Now studying the work of the ACO and health outcomes also referenced in S290 is admittedly complicated. There's an excellent analysis posted on Green Mountain Care Board's website by the independent health consultant Julie Wasserman, which has looked at the cost and quality performance of the ACO over several years. It raised or deepened for me a number of questions. So for example, why did One Care's 2018 Medicaid quality performance scores show a decline from 2017 in seven of 10 measures, including in two high cost areas, diabetes mellitus and hypertension? Why did its 2018 Medicare, Medicare score of 82.4% decline from 87.9% in 2017, which was itself a dramatic drop from 2016 score of 96.88%? Now, with its commercial population, One Care's 2018 quality score of 86.12% was a significant improvement over the prior year's 73.07%. However, One Care had declines from 2017 with that group in two critical population health measures, diabetes and hypertension, plus in its hospital readmission rate. So why were there declines in these areas as well? I also learned in a letter last December from Mike Fisher at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate to Kevin Mullen, the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, that only 2% of One Care Vermont's attributed patients in Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont's commercial population who are deemed to be of high or very high risk are receiving care management. Why are these percentages low, especially given that commercial lives have been attributed to One Care Vermont since 2014? Now, the reason I raise these issues is not to indict One Care Vermont, but over the course of 2020, as VHI grapples with the question of attribution, cost, and quality, and as Vermont NEA grapples with it as well, I've committed myself on behalf of the union, school employees, and school boards, and in my capacity as a trust administrator for VHI to investigate thoroughly and pursue answers to these questions and more. Putting my and Vermont NEA's energies into this endeavor, which involves drawing data from multiple sources, and engaging in conversations with One Care Vermont, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and others about how the attribution of lives and risk sharing will improve access to and the quality of care for school employees will be more productive and targeted than putting those efforts toward the production of an outside report. I also want to caution us as we move forward with our discussion about One Care Vermont to not confuse the process of ACO attribution and how we pay for doctors with systemic reforms that are needed, excuse me, and how we pay doctors to not confuse those two things with systemic reforms that are needed to address the root causes of the worsening affordability crisis in healthcare. Such reforms include budgeting rationally for what we pay for healthcare treatments and pharmaceutical products and lowering what we are charged in the process, to name a few. The ACO aspires to lower the rate of rising medical inflation, a worthy goal, and to keep it at no more than 3.5% annually. If it succeeds, it will mean that a healthcare system that is unaffordable now will be minimally 3.5% more unaffordable next year and in future years. I would also be remiss if I did not say something about the dire situation we are facing with the cost of prescription medications. And excuse the, the bluntness or crudity of how I'm, what I'm about to say, but those prices are killing us. Mm -hmm. And they're killing everybody in the pri private and public sector. In fact, I've been very impressed recently and told him so by very pointed comments that the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, Don George, has made about that situation. Essentially, one out of every five premium dollars is now directed to pay for prescription costs. That's true for VHI, approximately, and it's true for Blue Cross Blue Shield's book of business, as I understand it. And just to sort of ground you in the sort of severity of this crisis, 
The average price per month of specialty medications today for Vermont school employees and their families is $5,100. These are specialty medications. The monthly average price for generics is $23. Now, specialty medications are low-volume, high-cost drugs, often administered intravenously or by injection, that treat serious chronic conditions like hepatitis C, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, MS, HIV, and more. These drugs account for more than 50% of VHI spending on prescriptions, but only 2% of our subscribers take them right now. Somewhere between 85 and 88% of our members, their prescriptions are filled by generics on an annual basis. That accounts for just 20% of our spending. So the trend that's unfolding with specialty medications is also unfolding nationally. And we have been told by our independent consultants, as well as, in fact, by a very fine team at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, that if nothing is done in the regulatory environment, we are likely going to see those specialty medications, again, high cost, low volume, accounting for 60% of our drug spend in just a matter of a few years. Now, this is a big reason why Vermont NDE supports S246 to establish a state-based prescription drug affordability board under the direction of the Green Mountain Care Board. Maryland took this step last year, as I'm sure you know. Maine followed suit with a similar model. School boards and school employees and all Vermonters, all employers, public and private, need extensive regulatory relief from the predatory business practices and greed of big pharma. And we believe X2, excuse me, S246 is a very important step in that direction. Everything we can do as a state to lower health care prices for school boards and school employees and for all employers and their workers in the public and private sector must be done. And it's my hope someday that the federal government will step in and do its part as well. But S246 is certainly the step in the right direction. And if you deem it appropriate, we would certainly welcome inclusion of support for the Prescription Drug Affordability Board in S290. So just to close, returning to the bill before you, respectfully, Section 12, subsection A of S290, Vermont NEA, for the reasons I've cited, does not support an AHS report about One Care Vermont and the attribution of school employee lives to the ACO. We believe VHI can serve us very well in that capacity. Thank you for your patience and your time. Good. You've, got, you've, you've actually stepped outside of Section 12, but we're very appreciative of, your, uh, of the information you've brought us. We are aware of, of the issues that have been discussed out there in the real world regarding the failure of the ACO mm -hmm. and understanding that that failure is uh, a result of not is it a failure? There are also explanations for it. And I, I hope that you will go and look at some of the work that the Green Mountain Care Board, the agency, and others have done in response to the criticisms that have been made, knowing that um, the key for success for our waiver, for the all-payer waiver, is having a scale of uh, attribution. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that in this room with the exception of public employees. So we are not saying that all of our public employees will become part of the all-payer program, but we are a model, but we are asking that it be assessed, and I'm glad that you're doing that. Yes, ma'am. Um, the issue around uh, AHS study versus another, you don't want to work with the rest of the group or I mean, oh, wouldn't, it, the, wouldn't it make sense to have everybody in the same room rather than reinventing it? I think our focus at VHI in particular, and my focus as the union voice in that process, can be more targeted and as extensive as it needs to be by working through that vein. I speak to my union colleagues at VSEA, we're not yeah. strangers to each other sure. on these issues, and if I deem it necessary, and if they deem it necessary to speak to me, we will certainly reach out to each other. I presume, in fact, I would, I am calling for the investigation by VHI, investigation is too strong a word, our further analysis and study of One Care Vermont to be as full-blown and deep and multi-perspective uh, as possible. I've spent the last several months trying to catch up 
to what OCV is, what it has done, understanding its genesis, reading reports that sometimes feel way above my pay scale, and also talking to some really smart people who've been involved in healthcare or involved in ACO work for some time. And I want to deepen that process. And, I'm, and I think I can speak for my colleagues at VHI. They want the same thing. So, and, and just a couple other things. One, one to let you know that right now, healthcare reform in the state of Vermont is the ACO and the all-payer model. That is healthcare reform. So we have a choice to make it successful and to solve the problems that are embedded or to start over. And um, we've been working hard in this room to try to find the problems and solve them. So, and I encourage you to, to look at it in that, in that way. Um, S246 is a bill that we have looked at. And we've made some decisions about prescription drugs. And we will probably have a section in the bill on prescription drugs that um, we'll be looking at transparency of pricing, which I think is exactly what we all are trying to figure out. So um, thank you. This is good. We have questions. Yeah. Just, did we get an answer for why performance fell? We did. And part of it, um, I'm, I'm looking, um, um, <laughs> I know part of it was scale. Yeah, if you look at the population. Can you just give, can you give your name to the reference? Okay. Okay. Elena Bear, we read that here. Right, thank you. Regulation. So, okay. Well, please, we've got Medicare and Medicaid being the primary. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have the sicker people. Yeah, that is a, and, right. So it's, it, it's tough. I mean, right now, the folks who are there, um, we have blueprint people, chronically ill folks, and um, Medicaid folks who are costly. And do you want to say anything more about the... No, I mean, I think that's, that's precisely it. It's very difficult to look at effects when you're actually changing the population over time. So what we're trying to do is create a methodology for looking at year-over-year -year comparisons, which we just don't have the data yet. So, you know, once we have a trend, once you have two years of the same people, you can kind of see what the effect is of our, um, of our program. I mean, I've, had the, I've had the pleasure, I'd call it that, listening to you present at Green Mountain Care Board. Brilliant is very thorough. Um, so. And um, the only thing I would say, and clearly you're in a different world than I am when it comes to data, but there is data going back to 2014. Right? Right. So when we look at the Green Mountain Care, excuse me, when we look at OCD, Mountain Care Vermont, we are looking out over multiple years in terms of assessing, at this point in time, performance on both cost and quality. But it's not, not the all payer. All payers well, are 2015. 2016. We've got a five-year window on all payers. The cost sharing begins yeah. in 2017. Right. right. The program. Right. With Medicaid only right. begins in 2017. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. well, but there were commercial lives in one care of Vermont so, in 2014. You know, all it points out is, look, we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a transitional time, right? Correct. And so it's trying to catch up to the horse. You know what? We're, we're, you know that's actually a really good way of putting. It. That's a good way of putting it. We're trying to we're trying to catch up to, and and our catch up process, our analysis process, continued conversations with Elena and her colleagues. All of that, I assure you, will be part of our work at VHI and at Vermont at VA. Have you um, had an opportunity to visit at One Care Vermont? I have met as of my VHI colleagues with uh, representatives from One Care Vermont. Uh, my suggestion is to take a group up there and listen and see what the folks have to say, have an open meeting. We did that. We had an open meeting. We had others in the room. It is very helpful. It doesn't quell all the doubts, but what it does do is it brings you up to where they are and what their work is. And um, on the other side of that, um, doing the same with folks in DIVA. And this is why we said AHS, because if we're going to have six different groups going, doing the same thing, it, it slows everybody down or makes it more complex. So I'm just, I'm just suggesting, think about how you might want to uh, work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? There's a great three stooges routine. <laughs> where Curly is tasked with 
closing a leak at the end of a pipe. <laughs> so he puts another length of pipe on it. And it's still leaking. So he puts on a T. Yeah. Now he has two leaks. And it continues again, becomes more and more lengths of pipe, more and more complexity, until he ends up with about 500 leaks. It has never occurred to him that he has to close the end of the pipe. Right. Once you screw something up, everything you do to make it better makes it worse. Right. I think that's what we're doing with up there. No. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not, Senator. We're going to make it better. We're going right Another to... Another length of pipe. We're going right to ground zero. <laughs> uh, okay. Anything else? Any other questions for Mark? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You're, you've been very thoughtful in your response, and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. All right. So we will. We are finished, unless right. someone has other comments. Okay. So at four o'clock, we're in room eleven. And the goal is education, not petrification. So that be recorded, right? Or, yeah. 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 Huh? Okay. All right. We're finished.